Eric, I have interviewed a lot of divas on my show. None so remarkable as you, sir. He is a raconteur. He is a bon vivant. He is truly fabuleux, which is French for fabulous. Eric Gustafson, welcome to Divas Deluxe. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to be with you. And... Um... Nice to see this audience. Uh, I, I don't think they understand what we mean by diva, though. Um, well, we could perhaps begin by a very specific definition. How would you define the word diva? Well, in the dictionary, a diva is a goddess. Oh, but, well. But it is referred to often uh, as an um, opera singer having a fit. <laughs> now, I've known many opera singers having fits, and I've known many divas. Originally, my book was, being, was going to be called The Making of a Diva, but as time progressed, I realized that it's going to end in The Making of a Diva, and yes, there's strings all the way through it that build up to it, but I like the idea of the last guy waltzing. But now, diva, getting back to that, the, my definition has nothing to do with feminine per se, it's male or female. You know, there's a devo and a diva, but I call everything, people who have helped me on my path, a diva. And a diva who has meant, has given me instruction. It, they don't have to be uh, conversant in opera, they could be a plumber or a president or whatever, but uh, there are many divas and they're all in the book. Men, women of all professions. Thank you, thank you very much, Eric. By the way, this is being recorded for posterity, just to know, and I'm sure copies will be available for purchase as well as the book, Last Guy Waltzing. Speaking of Last Guy Waltzing, Eric, why that title? How did you come to call this book? And it is not your only book, it is just your most recent book. How did you arrive at the title, Last Guy Waltzing? By hitting my 78th birthday and looking at my address book and saying, dead, 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 dead. I am also not as well able to do a beautiful Viennese waltz as I used to. I used to be considered one of the best waltzes in America, and I've waltzed the likes of, well, Doris Duke around the floor and many other people. Um, but I can't do that anymore, and also if I could, Where's my partner? I am literally the last guy Walson. Well, I think you have an anecdote in the book which we could jump right into. Did you not dance with Rita Hayworth at Hal Prince's wedding? I did. Will you please give us that story, how that came about? There are two things in my life. If I could redo, I would. One of them was trying to dance with Rita Hayworth at Hal Prince's wedding. It was an utter disaster. I am so embarrassed to think about it, but uh, I was very thrilled at the moment because Hal Prince had at the wedding everyone from television, the films, um, uh, radio, stage. I mean, I, I was dancing Arlene Francis around and she said, Eric, are you in the theater? And I said, that's 10 down, Arlene. Remember her show? What's my line? Ten down, if you, didn't, if you gave the wrong answer. And um, I danced, uh, I asked Lena Horne, who looked fabulous that evening, to dance. She was the only one that turned me down. She said, let me give you a rain check, which was very gracious, uh, the way she did it. But I danced with her daughter, who was so fabulous, and I said, you should be on the stage. Little did I know she was the star of a Broadway musical. <laughs> I did not do my homework, but I had plenty of champagne. As the party went on, guests started to go home, and in one of the empty spaces at my table in came Rita Hayworth. Wow. But the difference between Rita and all the other guests was that she wore a simple in town for shopping woolen dress. Everyone else was in an evening gown, but she did have a fabulous fur coat, and she had on her arm on either side Zero Mostel and Gary Merrill, who had just been divorced from Be uh, Betty Davis. Well, Gary, Mastel, Gary Merrill and Zero Mustel were deep in conversation, and I screwed my courage to the sticking point and went and said, Miss Hayworth, could I have this dance? And she looked flustered, and she looked to them, and I said, they're busy talking. And I thought, just like, you know, uh, uh, Mickey Rooney and uh, Judy Garland in the barn, they do a, suddenly a fabulous number. I really believed we would. <laughs> well, wrong on several counts. One thing was that poor Rita Hayworth 
had um, a bit to drink. Not that I hadn't, but <laughs> she was not exactly following any lead I gave, and I thought I was a pretty strong dancer. And um, so I thought, well, I'll let her lead me. Mm -mm. The, the distended belly of love goddess pressed against my cummerbund, and we just shuffled. And I said, um, I thought, well, if you don't want to dance, um, we could sit down, thinking, oh, let's get this over with. There'll be no fabulous floor show as I expected. And she said, I love to dance. <laughs> so I said, then show me a smile. And she gave me a half smile. And I said, no. And she gave me a frown and then smiled. I said, that's more like it. So it was still not really moving anywhere. Uh, so I thought, well, conversation, maybe that'll make up for it. Um, oh, I knew one of your husband's ones. <laughs> she said, which one? <laughs> and and um, uh, Ali Khan, I responded. And it was so sad. She sort of flapped her wrist and said, oh, him. In such a sad way, I really felt that she was troubled by the mention of Ali Khan. And so I had no more conversation and I decided, well, now what? Um, oh, both of us having imbibed a bit, I said, let's knock the fucking boars off the floor. Very gentlemanly of me. And she said, fucking boar. And out went our elbows and our hips. And people looked to her abusing them so and saw Rita Hayworth and they backed off the floor, and then we went after the next one, and the next one, until we were alone on the ballroom floor. Again, distended belly of sex goddess against my cummerbund with no routine to do, and the band leader who knew, leader who knew me from all the balls I'd been to in New York looked at me like, what are you doing? When Gary Merrill came up and said, Rita, I think you should sit down, but that was not until everyone had been knocked off the floor. <laughs> so you did have your Mickey and Judy moment at Hal Prince's wedding. Well, in a way, yes. <laughs> you know, I have to say, Eric, in reading your book, your memory is prodigious. And I think it's all the more remarkable when you talk about having imbibed in this and imbibed in that, and yet you have this impeccable memory for detail. Are you aware that you have an extraordinary memory? Or are you just making it all up? No, I... <laughs> I'm known for my truthfulness. <laughs> I savor, I savor these moments because it was. A, I was looking for validation in many of the things I did, and I treasured, even if we did make a fool of ourselves on the floor. I treasured the idea that I could dance with Rita Hayworth, and uh, many of the other memories I had. Um, I also keep very careful notebooks. I also keep very careful press clipping books that had the date and the newspaper and when, and photograph albums. <clears throat> I probably have over 60 photograph albums alone. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I know what I wore, with whom, when, and where. <laughs> it's remarkable. You have said to me that you didn't want to be considered a name dropper, and yet we are so utterly fascinated by nearly every name in the book. And I want to visit some of those personalities and have you grace us with an anecdote here there. And I know for your comfort, um, you have something to say about Harry Truman and a particular belt. We all remember Harry Truman, don't we? Remember the inauguration? I was uh, watching it on television when Harry Truman handed off to Eisenhower. Anybody remember that? 1951, two, three. Okay. Yeah, good. Yeah. So he has an anecdote about Harry Truman. I'm not doing a strip tease. Oh, yes, he is. <laughs> yes, you are. To show you. Now, I want you to see. You, well, might, you might have to stand up. Okay, but first, I, I think I, I better build up to it a little okay. bit. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. John F. Kennedy had just been uh, inaugurated into the White House, and Jackie went very quickly into redoing the New York residence, which was a triplex on the top of the Carlisle Hotel on S Madison Avenue between 76 and 77th. Well, Harry and Bess Truman, to visit their darling daughter Margaret, who lived around the corner, was given use of this triplex while they were in town and the Kennedys were in Washington. Bess's nephew was sharing an apartment with me and invited me to meet his uncle and aunt, the Trumans. 
at, up at the Carlisle Hotel. I was quite nervous and put on my best suit and best behavior and went to visit them. Well, as I expected, Bess was rather, well, she was Baptist Bess. <laughs> um, I was to find out later, I was then uh, to stay as a house guest there for a few days, that one drink a day. Now, this is a person who loves the parties. I was very young and ambitious and energetic and went here, there, and everywhere. And um, one drink a day seemed quite a miraculous thing to try to do if you wanted to. <laughs> and I thought, oh dear. Well, anyhow, I sat there quietly waiting for maybe the one drink, but nothing. We were talking and chit-chatting. And um, finally, she said, oh, would you boys like something to drink? And I said, Baptist best means water. <laughs> I said, no, thank you, Mrs. Truman. And she said, I'd be happy to go to the kitchen and get you some water. <laughs> well, good old Harry. I became wild about Harry from that moment on. He came over and took my arm and said, a lot my girl knows. Because she was saying, they just arrived, there was nothing put in stock for drinking. And he said, come with me. And he led me into John F. Kennedy's study, which had the red telephone to the Moscow and the rocking chair. And I said, wow, history, if I pick that up. <laughs> Anyhow, he reached behind some books and pulled out a square bottle. And we, we proceeded to the kitchen, where he poured heavy doses into three glasses. Best was not uh, imbibing that day, or probably any day. So I was very relieved. and. Um, I thought he was really a swell guy. Uh, then uh, it came time a few months later to go to visit <clears throat> David's mother in Colorado, and we brought the Siamese cat. Two boys living on the east side of Manhattan always have a Siamese cat. <laughs> and um, we stopped to see Harry and Bess in Independence, Missouri. We took, of course, Amtrak. And there, if anyone had the forethought to look out the window from the train, would have seen Harry on the driver's side of the blue Oz, uh, town car, uh, Oldsmobile, um, and Bess on the other side. And in we got and went to Independence, um, their home in Independence, uh, where we stayed for three days. The other thing that, aside from the Rita Hayworth episode, that I really deeply regret doing was to Bess Wallace Truman. And that was when she kindly took us out to lunch at a, a little farm type restaurant uh, outside of the city. And a woman, we had ordered daiquiris, <clears throat> which evaporated very quickly in that atmosphere. <laughs> and while she was talking to her friend, I knew she would never offer me a second. I had the nerve, bad taste, rudeness to signal the waitress. <laughs> and, well, I mean, I was really thirsty. And I couldn't help it. It must have been the Independence, Missouri atmosphere that it just evaporated. The, the daiquiri went nowhere. I mean, it was gone. So, and she noticed it, said nothing, but I could tell I had done a mistake. But a very interesting thing happened that evening. In the sitting room after dinner, uh, Harry announced that he was going to bed early, but their daughter, Margaret, was going to be on television. Well, David, my roommate, excused himself, and Harry asked me to sit with his girl, who sat with her legs crossed looking at the television. Unfortunately, I couldn't look over my nose. I, I wanted to sit like this and look at her, because no one else could see her reaction to what her daughter was saying about her on television. She was talking about how she fooled her mother in, in getting away with dating people without the Secret Service or her parents knowing. And I wanted to say, what do you think about that? <laughs> but anyhow, I just sort of looked over. Anyhow, it was a very, very interesting time. Um, and what about the article of clothing? Oh, yes, we yes. forgot about that. <laughs> Revenons à nos moutons, as they say in French. Let's come back to our sheet. Merci. Uh, the, the morning I was leaving to get on Amtrak, Harry came to me and said, would you boys like to have two belts? One is um, with gold and rubies, a rancher's belt, given to her, him by the president of Mexico, and the other was the plain belt. So we saw how 
his nephew could get the plain belt. I was a little, just slightly more flamboyant. Yeah. And it's never been stolen because I don't think people realize they are golden rubies. So. <laughs> Thank you. That's and it has a T the, on it. The Harry Truman <laughs> belt story. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. I wanted to move us along because you've had uh, so many um, uh, uh, meetings with extraordinary people, and there's a lot of territory you want to cover, so I want to I want to ask us about a couple of other interesting people. Uh, the elusive Greta Garbo. Well, I'm glad you brought her up, <laughs> and, and Greta. Uh, I was working, and part of what I'd like to impart today is that I really did serious work in my life. I wasn't just <laughs> waltzing around <laughs> those kind of divas, but um, I had a wonderful job at Park Burnett Auction Gallery before it became Sotheby's. And I, uh, having been on this world tour with David for a year, I had Italian tailored suits. I looked very You sport. haven't told us who David is. Uh, oh, yeah, David, uh, that, yes, I, I suggested he was uh, Bess Wallace Truman's nephew. This is um, the connection with the Trumans. So uh, we had clothes made um, in Italy, and um, I looked very smart at Sotheby's, and it was the, a very chic auction house that people, a lot of people were afraid to go into. It was just so forbidding, but um, Greta Garbo loved beautiful things. You see her around the east side looking in antique shops and uh, often came into uh, Park Burnett. Park Burnett, everyone dressed in designer clothes and there was a hushed atmosphere of elegance. Greta Garbo came in with sneakers and a floppy hat and a <laughs> blue raincoat and she was obviously calling attention to herself for someone who didn't want to go, you know, to be calling attention to herself. She did it purposely, I'm sure. Anyhow, she always had that outfit on. Um, <laughs> the manager of the place made a point of being near her in case she wanted or needed something as a v VIP. And um, she looked across the big auction, not the auction room itself, but the showroom, and saw me there in my smart Italian suit and said, who is that beautiful boy? <laughs> I was 21 years old, and um, I was brought up to her, and when she heard my name, she said, that, that was my name. She was Greta Gustafsson from Sweden, and she said, you could be my nephew. Well, needless to say, that's all I had to hear, <laughs> because on two occasions, when people were being very grand and snooty about Greta's arriving on Friday on a yacht to stay with me. I said, please give love to my aunt. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. You know, you've introduced the, the topic of art. Uh, your life is your art, and your art is your life. And you have a couple of points that you want people to know about that are rather serious, and I want to bring that out in okay. front of our audience today. One is that you are claiming to have been the first person to introduce the idea of Meeting on the telephone for art auctions. Do you want to relate to us how that came well, about? Well, I have to elucidate, yeah. put it exactly correct. It had been done for decades that someone would be on the telephone at an auction. But I was the first one in America to use the telephone for an entire sale with one client. In other words, people would call and say, when lot 110 com comes up, call me and then I'll make a bit blah, blah, blah. But I did the entire sale, one client, and... It made art news in 1964, the spring of 1964. And, and another really important point is that you introduced contemporary art to Santa Fe. So please uh, regale us with that journey. I, I'd be happy to. I had, um, I, well, I had a gallery in Italy uh, at one point for the season for the Festival of the Two Arts, and then I came back and um, uh, decided that. I was not going to live in Italy. I was going to stay in the United States. And I called Margaret Jameson. I had an exhibition here in Santa Fe with the opening of the new opera, Opera House, and that was 1967. And, um, or maybe an eight, uh, 68. 66. And it was original costume and scenic designs for opera, ballet, and theater, but basically the Santa Fe Opera. And because, uh, I, and I didn't do it at her, her gallery because it was not appropriate at her gallery, but she put me in touch with the gallery. And then we became very good friends. Well, I called her and I said, I'm back from Italy. And she said, why don't you come out here after all your experience running galleries in New York, running the Italian gallery, running uh, the auction house operation. I would love it if you took over my gallery here. So I said, good. 
lovely idea, why not? Um, I like Santa Fe, and I came out, and she had blue chip art, the finest bloom and shine, and, and you know, the Taos and uh, famous Santa Fe artists in history that made the art scene here. But um, most galleries had schlock, quite frankly, cowboy Indian, nothing. But people would come from Europe to see her blue chip art, and um, I became aware of the young people in the town and the environment that were truly vivacious artists of great value who had to go to New York or Los Angeles to show. And I said, Margaret, these young people need your help. The gallery could really make a mark. Their work is stupendous, but why should they have to go to New York? It's here. So she said, well, let's try it out with a Christmas sale. And then we had also the Fritz Shoulder Show coming up. And, and I was not the first. There were a few of us that felt this way. And uh, as a matter of fact, I talked to about four different people. We were going to start a syndicate of pushing contemporary art in Santa Fe. And I was thought to be crazy. And I broke my leg. That was not crazy. That was <laughs> disastrous. And I went back to New York. But in the meantime, uh, a gallery from Arizona came and cleaned up and other people started showing the art and it became a center and is a center now, uh, one of the major centers for contemporary art, one of the three in America, all because I was so crazy. <laughs> and that kind of dovetails very nicely to ask you to talk about your relationship to R.C. Gorman. Um, and now uh, what would crazy the... have to do with R.C. <laughs> Gorman? I mean, that's a stretch. <laughs> a conservative boy like that. <laughs> um, R.C. heard that we were showing Fritz Shoulder in the gallery in Santa Fe, and he let it be known to his Georgian, not Georgian from Russia, but Georgia, USA manager, that he would like to meet me, and he wanted to have a show as well, because they were in competition, R.C. and Fritz. So... I went up there, and it, it was hilarious because the, the manager noticed I had a pre-Columbian piece on, and he said, I would love to have that. And I said, I'd like to have a portrait done by R.C. Gorman. He said, okay, I'll arrange it, and give me the necklace. So R.C. came, and I had his glass of vodka filled to the top. And, <laughs> but it was at, at the Jameson house. She was away, happily, and I told the staff to stay in the other part of the house. But in this part... R.C. set up his easel, and he said, the only way I'm doing a portrait for you is if it's nude. So I said, well, it, it wasn't the first nude that I've been posing for. <laughs> and even if it, there were others that weren't even recorded on canvas, but we don't have to go there. But um, So I thought, okay, and I'm holding, standing holding this nude pose, and he's working away, sipping and working away. Finally, he shows me the nude portrait. I could have been sitting down fully dressed for the way he had me in full color profile, one slash for a shoulder and a nipple. And that was the nude portrait. <laughs> that nude portrait has since been used as a frontispiece for his dessert section in one of the cookbooks. <laughs> <laughs> and he inscribed my copy of To Eric, My Favorite Tart. <laughs> That's fabulous, Eric. Since we're, we're now in Santa Fe, um, will you tell us about, uh, you have a Georgia and Keith. And oh, that, that was quite wonderful. I don't know whether um, I'm imbued with some sort of a, a halo, not a halo, but a glow or something, <laughs> but a lot of famous people stop in their tracks to greet me thinking they know me, and then they, they look befuddled after a minute. They say, oh, I made a mistake. <laughs> but anyhow, I had an art gallery in New York City, and one of my favorite artists was um, very much involved and influenced by George O'Keefe. She was, George O'Keefe was having a major retrospective at the Whitney Museum, and I had two tickets to the opening. So I asked Natalie if she would join me to see her mentor's work. She was thrilled, but it had to be in the afternoon because she had children, teenage children, in her home in Connecticut, and there was a big snowstorm coming. She had to get home to make sure her children were safe. So we went on the early part of the invitation and to the through the entire exhibition, and we both were ooing and aahing over the talent and fabulous um, paintings that were exhibited by George O'Keefe. We were in the elevator going down, and she, 
She looked at me and she said, I'm sorry we didn't get to see the great lady. The doors opened and across the lobby, maybe a thousand people between us. I said, there she is. And she was coming through the revolving doors and people left and right were trying to grab at her and stop her and she was like an ocean liner cutting through the waves. And she got closer and closer and closer and put out her hand and took my hand and said, you're my friend. Wow. Well, I introduced her to, George, uh, to Natalie, who I'm sure peed in her pants. Because <laughs> there she was talking to George O'Keefe. And it was memorable. That's fabulous. Truly. And to be uh, ecumenical about it, how about Pope John the 23rd? <laughs> <laughs> Well, that, that, was, that was when I was living in Rome on my round the world that year that David and I uh, spent uh, on the Grand Tour. Uh, well, we got a private audience with Pope John the Twenty Third, mostly because of his connections, David's political connection. I don't think I could have pulled it off. Maybe I, I never tried, but anyhow, <laughs> we had a warm invitation from the Vatican. So. The day before going to visit the Pope, I went to an office in downtown Rome to collect the printed invitation, and there was an Irish priest there, and I said, I've come to collect my invitation to meet the Heavenly Father. Oh. And he said, yet another Protestant. <laughs> you mean the Holy Father, you're much too young to be meeting the Heavenly Father. So I, I said, yes, 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 anyhow. <laughs> Well, what does a little Lutheran boy from the Bronx know about anything? So, um, the next day we uh, bought trinkets at the little shops and so that we'd have them in the pockets, they were blessed, and then we'd give them to Catholic friends in the, in the United States or wherever. And uh, it was absolutely uh, quite amazing that this man, the Pope came in looking not well, looking very serious and well, really ill and pasty and gray. And, and he saw the six or eight of us, and he said, who wants to speak French? Who wants to speak? And, and he would switch from, and he got more and more excited. And you could see in his throat it was getting all pink. And, and he was having a lovely time. And I think he forgot he was the Pope. <laughs> I'm serious, he was so darling. <laughs> Oh, you're stopping at this point. All right. Well, <laughs> so, he did nothing improper. On, on Pope like, and that's a good thing, because no, otherwise you would have told no, us. No, but he was just like a little boy, you know. Some of what we share is love of all things French, and uh, it, it gives me tremendous pleasure to ask you about your experiences. One of my favorite recently deceased, Jean-Louis Barrault, who was the eminent uh, director and actor, uh, and I think that it was Les Enfants du Paradis that was the thing that put him on the, on the international front, but I know you've got a couple of... Yes. Tasty, uh, I'm searching for the word. Morsels. Yeah, at least morsels. Okay. Um, soupçon of this and a soupçon of that about Jean Louis Barrault. Well, Jean Louis Barrault came to New York to direct at the Metropolitan Opera Carmen. And I went to the Met quite frequently. I went to the Met since I was 12, standing room. And I was fascinated and overcome by just the whole concept of opera and and the world of opera and the world that revolved around the world of opera. Um, and when I heard, because I had been a theater student, when I heard Jean-Louis Barrault was in New York City and at the Met, I made sure that I was going to meet him, as I've done with a few people. Well, you and, do say that you, you put yourself in front of famous people. That was one of the... Uh, you have to be out there. <laughs> You're not going to meet anyone sitting at home with a box of chocolates looking at the daytime soaps. <laughs> well, anyhow, um, a great friend of mine uh, was giving a, well, I was going to say a, a party. It, it was more than a party. Um, it was a special um, present for Jean-Louis Barrault. She had gotten friendly with him at the rehearsals and he said that he had never smoked pot. And he said there's such, there seems to be such a, this was in the 60s, and, um, and there's well, maybe early 70s, 60s. And uh, he, she said, well, I know people that could introduce you to that if that's what you want to do. Uh, so she 
engaged a group of us to come and meet Jean-Louis Barrault in her Park Avenue apartment. And there was a small, beautiful uh, den, a library, where uh, she felt by smoking it there it would be intensified and it wasn't drifting all over the place. So anyhow, uh, the thing that amazed and really annoyed me was that all these people were coming and they had no idea who he was. Even my hostess, I had to bring her a book and say, you know, you're being friendly with him, but you don't realize the magnitude of this man. He's one of the great people of the 20th century in the theater world. So I said, read this book. Here are some pictures. And so anyhow, she knew a little bit, but no one else. And so I took it upon myself to be close to him at the party so that he would have someone to talk to and have something to say about his life, you know? I thought he deserved recognition. So I made pleasant commentaries about, you know, his people in uh, Les Enfants du Paradis, and, and I had been to his theater in Paris, what have you. Well, the pot smoke was very thick, <laughs> <laughs> and I found that there was a sunflower growing out of the top of my head that was getting taller, and it was very heavy. So I laid down at the feet of Jean-Louis Barrault, and at one point I opened my eyes, and there he was, performing one of his marvelous pantomimes, and he was just doing it. And I said, I'm probably the only one seeing it. Thank you, what a nice gift. <laughs> and, and that's sort of... Uh, the story about Jean-Louis Barrault and my visit with him in New York. I think that's a good opportunity to take a little station break and remind you that these anecdotes and many, many more, including amazing photographs, are in uh, the book that you'll be purchasing and having Eric sign. 174 after... photos. How many? 174. Prodigious. I want to ask you uh, about another personality because it's so much fun to hear your anecdotes. Elizabeth Taylor? Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, you know, I met her several times, but the one time that she literally not only changed my life, but saved my life is when I was with R.C. Gorman, who she was a great pal of, as in the back of the book, there's a picture of them kissing, and I call it two monkeys playing or something. Oh. And, <laughs> but she said to him, get your ass over to Betty Ford. Because he, she felt he was drinking too much. She had been to Betty Ford. She helped Betty Ford in her early years going there. And she was a model of, of um, uh, the need for people to look for sobriety, to live sober lives. And she said it to R.C. Gorman, but I heard it. There were the three of us there. And people had told me, after decades of exuberant and less so than exuberant drinking, I used to spill more than most people drank, um, <laughs> that that message was for me. And even though other people had told me to go, the empress of the cinema, yeah. that was a different thing. I got on the phone and I booked my way into Betty Ford. Anyhow, she saved my life with that comment. But we had, uh, I first ran into her, uh, not literally, but we were in Rome together uh, when she was doing Cleopatra and I was doing my grand tour. And uh, Richard Burton's uh, private aide was a friend of mine, also Richard, and all the stars of Cleopatra, when there was a major function, would get two tickets to go to it. And uh, Richard Burton never went, but gave them to his, his aide, who gave them to me. And I thought, that nice Richard Burton going home to his wife on the Via Appia Antigua. <laughs> what a sweet man working all day and then going home to Sybil and the children. Well, I came back from, I, had, I went to Turkey and uh, some other, Greece, and came back to the famous telegram, Burton plucking brains out of Taylor. And then I realized he wasn't going home to Sybil, he was with... Elizabeth. And I said, you know, I really have to thank her someday for keeping him busy because I got to see Joan Sutherland's first appearance with her husband <laughs> at conducting her in Rome. I got to the ballet, to the opera. I, I was with all the stars of Cleopatra. She deserves a thanks. And it never occurred to me, why isn't Elizabeth Taylor there? But all was revealed. So um, a little later, jump maybe 10 years later, when she was doing uh, Little Foxes on Broadway, she invited R.C. Gorman and I to 
be her guests at the theater to see her. And when I went into the back, into the dressing room, and we were the only ones allowed back there because there had been a threat against her life, and the police were not allowing anyone, no one. And uh, there was a famous actress on the cast also, and it was her birthday. She was upset because no one could come back and wish her happy birthday. But anyhow, I started to thank her for uh, keeping Richard busy in Cleopatra. <laughs> And she shut me off as though I hadn't said a word. And it was so professionally done, it was terrific. It was fabulous. Yeah, Eric, you, you seem to divide your life as, uh, as exemplified by this book, uh, the period before sobriety and after. And you brought us to the point where Elizabeth Taylor was your um, goddess, if you will, that sent you ultimately to sobriety. I'd love for you to read for us the poem that you wrote on page 259. I've got it here. That's heavy it's, duty. Yes. It's called Gaily Lit Boulevards. And the chapter, which is chapter 16, is entitled Get Your Ass Over to Betty Ford. <laughs> what else? Gaily Lit Boulevards, a monologue. I suppose the culmination was that morning when I looked into a mirror and saw a bloated aging queen with only the slightest resemblance to my mind's image of myself. The total of various experiences afforded by quarter day rampages flooded my consciousness. There was a mixture of delicious mad abandon tinged with embarrassing aggressive bad taste. A magic horror show. It seemed at that moment, the only moment possible, the decision had to be made. It was time to hang up those broken roller skates. I was thoroughly tired of careening down gaily lit boulevards, only to find myself at some dead end or in a darkened alley, usually with someone I did not really want to be with. Gaily lit boulevards can be fun with all those vibrations, alluring inducements, promising the unattainable, scintillating illusions, shimmering aspirations, Nightmarish loss of control or proportion, a topsy-turvy world with little meaning outside of the quest for fresh pleasure and an insatiable thirst. Broken roller skates make a horrible sound. Direction is lost and perhaps unimportant. The lights blur, swim before the careening figure. Few notice or seem to care. The pulse continues, echoes fade, with new voices soon to add to the sum memory of inconsequentia. There is no winner in this marathon block party. Endurance with grace is the badge inconspicuously worn by the least of the losers. It's lovely. I think Endurance with Grace might be the title of his next book. So you transitioned, Eric, into Buddhism. Yes. And I would love for you to share about that. The millennium was coming, and my dog, Fred, my beloved dog, Fred, who followed me everywhere and was my best friend, um, well, he and alcohol, I'm not sure which was the best friend, but anyhow, the alcohol went and Fred definitely was. Um, he died and went to uh, Yowler's Heaven, and I was now free for the first time in 17 years to um, travel someplace where the back seat of the car was no longer occupied by Fred, but I could go places abroad without him sort of saying, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm not allowing this. So anyhow, I said, where do I want to go? Well, I don't know much about Hinduism or about uh, Buddhism or about um, what is a Muslim? What's all this about that we hear so much conflict? Why don't I go to India for the millennium? Then I will go to Cambodia the next year and then to Thailand the following year, Japan, and I made a list. Well, I went to India for three months, caught by the short hairs, and I said, no, I'm going back to India. I don't understand. You know, I'd look at something in my right hand and say, I finally got the message about what this is about. Then I'd look in the left hand, and the opposite's true. So I said, sooner or later, it's going to, the penny's going to drop, and in the meantime, I am caught with the fascination of India. And with the fascination of India came the various religious uh, leanings, and I became more and more imbued in uh, actives. By active, I mean I had indulged or participated in uh, prayer and meditation before that. But now I actively embraced myself with it to the point where it 
became a, a, truly a way of life. And uh, I got very involved with Hinduism and then realized that Buddhism was an outgrowth of it. And here in Santa Fe, when I moved back here, uh, there was the TNL, which is a Buddhist center. And uh, I just got into the swim of things there and loved it so much that it became uh, strongly meaningful to me. And consequently, um, part of the year was spent in India every year and part of it here. And then to compound it, I fell in love in India. So <laughs> uh, my, my heart and my soul was sort of both places. Have I answered your question? I, I don't know, have you? <laughs> sort of. <laughs> I want to open up our broadcast to questions from the audience. But before we do that, Eric, what would you like us to deeply know about you? What a wonderful question. <laughs> Most people tell me what they know about me, and they're wrong. But um, what I want people to know about me, well, first of all, I like people to know my behavior is geared by my deep belief that you have to be out there with energy and embrace life for it all to begin to make sense. You can't just sort of get wound up in nonsense or unimportant, uh, time-consuming things, but, but to wake up and say, ah, I'm alive, I'm embracing, and then, and you know, things happen to me when I do that. Incredible things. You want to know what? <laughs> I live in a little tiny place. I used to live in a big place. I live in a very little tiny place, which is perfect for this time in my life, and it is redundant, not redundant, Res resplendent in, resplendent in volunteer flowers. And when you consider that my property is where I live is plastic sheets with pebbles on it. Do you mean flowers just show up? Yes. The way pink flamingos have shown up? No, no, the pink flamingos are there by purpose oh. to complement the flower. No, but, but I have yellow, yellow uh, snapdragons that Last year came up quite a bit, but now it's a profusion, and they bloom and rebloom and rebloom, and there's a field of them, and there's birds in the tree, and all around me, all my other little casitas, there's nothing, <laughs> and I haven't planted them. Although some mean person said I was making it up when I said that you were volunteers, and then and, and morning glories, profusions of them, and this is a place that is geared for not having that. We're not allowed to have it even, but it happens. Well, it's your enduring charm that makes them appear, I'm sure. I don't know if it's charm, and it's endurance of some sort, but there's, there's an energy, and life, what, what I'd like people to know about me is my belief in energy, good energy, good karma, do the right thing, go out there and do it. And do it. Have we got questions that you'd like to... Oh. I'm going to be passing among you with the microphone, and Eric's going to stay up here and answer. Yeah. Give us your name and your question. I, I, I'm a boy from Brooklyn. He's from the Bronx, so we've probably seen each other passing in a subway station or something. My question is this. Would you describe uh, what it was like uh, to be undressed by uh, Jacqueline Kennedy? <laughs> Um, stunning. <laughs> but I have to explain, you're giving the wrong impression. I was coming out of my building on 72nd between 5th and Madison, and on the ground floor of that building was Dr. Feelgood that her husband, Jackie's husband, John F. Kennedy, went to because of his back aches and uh, uh, severe pain. Uh, so he was always getting medicated there, and she was with two ser secret servicemen crossing the street the middle of the street, not at the corner like good girls do, but the secret servicemen were looking left and right, and she was looking at me slowly <laughs> up and down with a little smile on her face like, hmm, wouldn't we have fun? <laughs> All righty then, moving on. Have we got any other questions for Eric? 
Well, I've got a... Oh, no, we do. We do. Let me bring the microphone to you. Well, we do for the video portion of our broadcast. I want to get this book. Um, I was babysitting some boys in Nambe, and 10 years later I found out their dad was a former beach boy. And I was a former science nerd. I used to tutor chemistry and math. So we did just the opposite. We dressed up and, and, and we danced and we sang and we wore costumes. And now the boys are going to become a doctor and one guy's got a film studio in, in L.A. But the coolest thing was I found out at Kinko's Coffee Store that the dad was now engaged in building these schools in Thailand to help women get educated. And I was wondering what you could tell us about um, what you've seen in like India. I've heard they're building computer schools. And I was really excited to hear that about um, this man. I, I, go, I um, used to go until this past year to India every year, once or twice a year. And I always had um, a little house or an apartment where I had a caregiver take care of me. And we, he also made me walk. <coughs> and in that walking, um, I saw little tiny places that were like a school, but they weren't. A f but they had, they had computers and screens in there, and these little kids were in there, learning their computer skills, which was amazing because the schools themselves are not necessarily very good. I've been to schools. I've offered to talk to the kids about what it is for me to visit India and what what the outside world is like, mm -hmm. but uh, often the teachers are remiss in hearing for work. They're very casual whether they'll even go to class. And the kids, it's hit and miss. But I was amazed at the little, the small tod toddlers, not, well, young children, playing with the computers avidly and that this was set up for them. Oh, no. <laughs> Eric, before we conclude our broadcast, and I want to remind you, Eric will be signing copies of Last Guy Waltzing. Who have you yet to meet that you would like to? <laughs> I suppose if people were really paying attention, that would be a very dangerous question because that person might say, well, what about me, ingrate? You know? <laughs> um, I, can, I don't think there is anyone that I haven't met that I want to. Pope Francis. No, I'll tell you why not. <laughs> I think... I think what he's doing is from the heart and lovely, except I think he's letting the, the, the Vatican down in that it is very naive for people to believe that the poorest of people don't want pomp and circumstances, bread and circuses. They thrive on it and need it. He wants to get rid of all of that so that and disperse the money but it doesn't work that way. It never has and never will. It's a, it's a pipe dream. Well, I think that what you're probably saying in a large way is that glamour is essential. And it's clear you have led and continue to lead a very glamorous life. So thank you, Eric Gustafson, for sharing so much of it with us this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you all. And we invite you to have a personal word with him at the table.